Hey man, do you remember the good old time when you and me used to create React components using the JSX or the TSX file extension? Well, turns out that's so 2020, man. We don't do that anymore. Instead, we now use CSS as a file extension to write React components. Yes, really. Mist CSS, write React components using CSS only. And if you're like, what? How does that even work? Yeah, right? Same thing for me a new, better and faster way to write visual components. CSS and JS? Nope, JS from CSS. And in that regard, it's the exact opposite of my by far most hated kind of CSS framework ever, which is styled components. I don't know how people can use it. We use it at our old work. It's super common in enterprises actually, styled components, but I hate it because it brings CSS into JavaScript land. And in that regard, it's literally the exact opposite of Mist CSS, what we're looking at in this video. So for example, styled components brings CSS into JavaScript. Right? And I don't think that's a good approach, to be honest with you. I don't think it works very well. And Miss CSS does literally the exact opposite. It generates JavaScript from CSS. And that's really interesting. And apparently there are a bunch of benefits that come with that over things like style components. It supports a lot of stuff and more to come like Next, Tailwind and Remix. Yes, you can use Tailwind CSS to write your React components. And it generates TypeScript types for you. Automatic type safety, clean separation between visual stateless components and others. Trust me, we're gonna get to this. This is one of the most interesting, interesting parts of this. Perfect DX, well, yes, because it's literally just CSS you need to write. It's supported everywhere and it's fast with no additional performance cost. So it doesn't have any kind of overhead like, for example, style components does. The guy that made all of this is called Tippycode. And you might know this guy from a super popular API, and that's the JSON placeholder. I think we all used it as we were getting into web development. This is like a fake API, if you don't know what it is, serving about 3 billion requests each month. Same guy that made this fake API that literally everybody uses, also made Miss CSS. After installing one single dependency that we use as the code generator later on, you're gonna see that we can literally already get started by creating a new file and they call it the button.mist.css. And once we hit enter, we can literally write a React component in CSS. Let's try it out. So first off, we can scope the styles we're about to write to this certain button component that is outlined here in the documentation. This is a pretty good idea to not couple your styles too heavily to the DOM structure, and that makes refactoring later pretty intuitive. You're gonna see what this does exactly once we get into the code generation step. And inside of here, we can define the styles that should unconditionally now apply to our component. Now this also works with Tailwind right here, but I think this is one layer of abstraction too much, right? We're already writing React in CSS, so let's not get there yet. For example, we can always apply a font size of one rem, and we could also apply a border radius of 0.25 rem, just like they do in the documentation. And this would literally already be a React component. We can try this out together. So this is a Vt application. Let's uh, stop this and run npm x mist css and then dot slash source. So that's going to run through our entire source directory and code generate React components from this CSS file, co-locating them with a CSS file right here. So it just created this TypeScript file. And if we take a detailed look at this, then first off, we notice a syntax error. That's weird. That is weird. That didn't happen while I was testing this out before. Anyways, let's save this file. This is the React component it generates. So automatically it imports our CSS file. And right now it only applied a class name for us. And this class name, the button class name, is what I mentioned earlier. If you take a look at the scope, we apply this to the class names right here. It only applies to the button component. That's how we can scope our styles to this component. And now for the props, because you remember when it said it generates TypeScript, TypeSafe props for us, all of that jazz. Well, it really does. And the way we declare props is like this. We can say and, and then in angle brackets, a data minus, for example, size. This could be any prop you want. This is the prop name right here. So we're gonna call it size right now. And let's assume we wanted a large option, just like in the documentation. Well, what CSS property does that correspond to? That's the question. For example, the font size, this could also be, uh, for example, the line height. That would probably also make sense, but let's leave it as this. And then once again, run the code generation step. That's gonna create or React component 
component once again and hopefully yeah this time the syntax error has gone weird that it was there but anyways you can see it generated the type safe property size size up here with the options that we have and also applies it to the button element so that means we can now use this button in our app we can use it right here and import it from the file however be careful by default it will use the css file as the import we want the tsx file the css file is not a react component we can import but we need the code generated one right and then we can already see that we can now pass the size as a property in a type so way it just has the large option right here and we can put anything in here because this button by default already accepts the children component and puts them right here and the thing is if you wanted an additional property for the size as the option right it's as easy as adding it right here and the merging of these props will automatically be done based on the name that we give it like the size for example right so assume we run this code gen once again and by the way no in reality we don't need to run this every time if we run our app once then it will automatically kind of hot reload so no you don't need to run the code generation every time but if we now take a look at the component that is generated from this you can see the data size is being passed into the button and the merging of the properties happens automatically so now we can either pass a large or a small button into here and that's gonna work in or app just like that one of the biggest caveats of this entire thing is listed right here in the how to section and that is right here how do you do interactivity for example with state react components in almost no cases are completely separated you always want to have some kind of interaction with them keep things in state for example if you wanted to keep track of a counter inside of this button right how would you do that well you would use state for that the thing is if you notice if you go into the file right here that is generated it says generated by miss css do not modify so we can't go ahead and just have some state in our component and keep track of anything that involves logic and i guess from a clean architecture standpoint that does make sense but to be real with you i never do this in my own apps i always kind of mix the business logic with the components and the approach that mist css uses or forces us into us here i think force is a strong word but let me just show you what they intend for us to do so basically we have a button logic.tsx and inside of here we can now import or generate a button that is completely isolated contains no logic at all and then wrap it with custom logic for example const button logic this is just going to be an arrow function component and in here we both return or button that we get from the mist dot tsx file from the code gen and now wrap it with the business logic like state making api calls and so on and so on and kind of splitting this one button this isolated button up into two components where one handles logic and one is the actual just style component and you know what i'm not sure yes in large projects this is how it's done at my previous work codebase for example there were like hundreds hundreds of files and a clean approach like this would make sense in smaller projects i think this adds more overhead than it adds benefits but that said all in all i think this project does look interesting it's certainly nothing that i thought i'd ever need but now hearing the idea of writing react components using css only i wonder how the adoption is gonna be especially in like larger enterprise contexts i could see an adoption of this if this ever gets ready to be used in production great as it is it's definitely not because as we can see in the roadmap right here this is a new project expect breaking changes until v1 and i think this is like v0.3 so it's still pretty far away from the v1 and it's nowhere near ready to be used in any kind of enterprise or production setting but the idea is interesting what do you think i i really wonder what do you think about this way of writing React components? Honestly, I was surprised to see this approach. I, I never thought about it. I never needed it. But it, it I mean, you, you got to admit, it's kind of interesting, right? I'm not sure if I see like a really bright future for this, to be honest. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think this has a future, especially in like enterprise adoption? Does it make sense to write React components in a language that is not meant for React components at all? Because the upside is, as we saw, that the components are very isolated. It forces you into a certain way of writing React code that some would call cleaner than what most of us actually do. That's gonna be it for this video. I'm gonna see you in the next one. Until then, have a good one and bye-bye.